It was early October in Florence, and two very excited men were on their way to collect the keys to their new apartment in a historic Italian palace. And after just three hours of bureaucratic gymnastics at the notary's office, it was time to head over to their new neighborhood and toast to this final blissful moment of calm before the storm. Because you see, they had just ten weeks to make their new wing inside of this palace habitable, a space that hadn't been properly lived in for 75 years. Welcome, good people, to our new series, Renovating a Palace, which I'm so excited to finally bring to you nine long months after we announced that we'd confirmed the agreement to buy this place. I've already gone into detail about the state of the apartment when we'd bought it, along with our renovation plans in another video. So from this point on, we're going to be diving into the renovation itself. And for a cheeky sneak peek of the final grand reveal of this apartment, stick around to the end of the video. And so, without further ado, let's jump forward in time by a couple of weeks to reveal the early transformations taking place here. You'll immediately notice the doorway to the right being opened, reinstating a threshold which had long since been bricked up, connecting our bedroom to the grand fresco room. On the far wall, the archways that once connected to the neighbor's apartment have now been fully sealed, and the predisposition work for the new water pipes and electrics are well underway. From the moment that we got given the keys, we knew that we were just 10 weeks away from having to move out of our old apartment, but two weeks in, we were initially pretty confident thanks to the fast progress being made. Now, because our time frame was so tight and the full size of the apartment stood at a whopping 170 square meters, we had to preemptively plan to focus on just one wing of it. You'll recall that the idea was to create two independent guest apartments, shown here, which would have to be tackled further down the road. For these initial 10 weeks, our focus had to be on the frescoed wing of the apartment, bringing hot water, electrics and flooring to at least one bathroom, one bedroom and the living area. Ultimately, this is to be the wing that we'd plan on living in, so it made sense for this to be our ground zero from which we'd build up everything else. By week three, we'd had the partition wall with the neighbor insulated and the predispositions for the kitchen more or less complete. But the growing pains of any renovation began to set in, thanks to some delays in what would become the bedroom. For example, you see here that the trenches have started to be closed, and we were hoping to, with this wall, also be able to close it with the carton jazzista, who is the guy who does the drywall. But uh, unfortunately, the electrician has not predisposed the two applique lights, which we wanted to have either side of the bed. You can kind of see the the plan we have there and as such um, this is one uh, example of the many uh, but we're unable to proceed with painting this weekend as we had initially wanted. A month in the utility trenches were all plastered up which signaled that the huge job of laying the flooring was about to begin. This could mean only one thing that it was time for a day trip to buy our floor tiles. Fortunately for us, just to the south of Florence is one of the heartlands of Italy's ancient terracotta tradition, and after a few site visits, we found the perfect manufacturer. Beyond the typical rectangular shapes, which we'd be using in the corridor spaces, we were able to find hexagonal tiles for the bedrooms, as well as a large enough supply of the diamond shape, which would be sufficient for the fresco room. It's worth noting that we did know going into this that genuine terracotta flooring is more expensive and harder to maintain than faux modern tiling, but this really came down to us wanting to have a finish that would feel just as fashionable and appropriate for the apartment even a century from now. Back on site, the screed was already being mixed up, and the time-consuming process of re-leveling the entire apartment began. This was a little nerve-wracking since all of the piping was at this point being locked in beneath the screed. Because we were short on time, we had no way to fully test for leaks and short circuits. So simply put, we had to blindly trust the workmanship of our tradesmen. And so, on week five, the moment finally arrived that we could start taking over the contractors and get stuck in with the painting. The recent delivery of the tiles gave us a bit of a storage problem. And so not as to disturb the neighbors in the communal courtyard, we brought them all up by hand. 
Being famously porous, we had to complete the painting before laying them, so as not to risk staining them with paint after installation. And with many an espresso under our belt, we gently slid into the final half of our 10-week renovation window, the pressure subtly increasing with each passing day. And with the painting complete in just a few days, and a little demonstration from our supplier as to how we were to individually split the terracotta tiles, we got to work preparing the almost 70 square meters of flooring needed to make the target spaces habitable. It was time to throw ourselves into the deep end of tile laying. So we've just made quite a dis exciting discovery. We were starting to just do the dry run of the chevron shape here in the main fresco room. And I noticed by playing around with the end piece that actually if this diamond were twisted on its side, it would fit perfectly in that gap there. As a result, I then started to build out the whole shape from that concept and the dimensions allow us to do this pattern instead, which I think is so much more interesting. On the one hand, you get sort of this 3D hexagonal shape, or from another perspective, it's sort of like a star. And anyway, as much as we loved the chevron, we think that this is going to be the new pattern going forward. And so began applying weeks of YouTube research on how to custom cut and lay these tiles, realizing that most of the tools and advice out there applied mostly to faux modern tiling, leaving us to make mistakes and learn as we went. So just like any good kitchen recipe, the only way to know if your towel glue is makes the right consistency is to do the trial just like when you're mounting eggs. So if it doesn't go down, it's good. Progress at first was painfully slow, taking two days just to tile a quarter of the room, but we soon hit our stride. We might have been amateurs and the process was pretty physically grueling, but fundamentally we loved what we were doing, and throughout it all we kept each other going. As the hours went by and we grew more tired, we'd sometimes rotate shifts so that we could stay as late as possible. And several all-nighters later, the transformation was really beginning to take hold. But just when we were about to pat ourselves on the back for a job well done, we realised we'd made a very obvious mistake. So concerned were we about avoiding getting paint on the tiles, it somehow never occurred to us that we should be cleaning the tiles from the glue as we lay them. And so, just as we'd thought we'd finished, we had the disheartening task of spending countless hours scraping and clearing the tiles so that they could finally be sealed with both a chemical sealant and a natural waxing layer. It may have taken us into week 7, but the final result could not have been more worth it. But in any renovation, the next drama is just around the corner. We came here this morning uh, super excited and thrilled with the finish of the, the terracotta flooring that we, we did in the main fresco room, but paired with that has been a rather unpleasant discovery, learning that the attachments, this here being the dishwasher, have started to seep through the wall, meaning that there's a loose connection in there somewhere. So this is going to be a bit of a job to tackle. And speaking of water connections, the conversion from gas to the more energy efficient electric boiler was well underway, and that old blue tiled shower room had at last been gutted, repiped, and made ready for a new lease of life. A full carload of tiling sufficient for the four bathrooms we'd eventually be completing at the ready, it was time to shift focus to getting at least one bathroom fully functioning in the next couple of weeks. With the fresco room grouting being finished off by M, it was down to me to transform the space. Not coming together too badly. Um, I'm stopping for today. Tomorrow, we're going to be focusing on the awkward cut where the tiles join there, but they're perfectly aligned, so it should create quite a seamless continuation of the the, the square shape. Now the tiling needed to be fully completed before any of the bathroom fixtures could be placed. So with my favourite grouser now in tow, we made fast progress. And before we knew it, a fully fitted sink and shower was in place. The shower tower was actually taller than expected, so after chipping off the dried glue of the previous tile run, I extended the motif all the way to the ceiling, completing the look to what it is now. 
Two of our three target rooms now made functional, by week eight it was time to paint up the bedroom, with the help of a trusty new toy which was a huge time saver, particularly with the high ceilings that were also curved. So come with me as we move into our soon-to-be bedroom. We've started to do a dry run of how the tiles will look. We're mapping out where the awkward cuts need to go, but uh, my god, it's uh, not cheap, it's not easy, but we love them. Revisiting the terracotta tiling was like facing anew a slight trauma that wasn't even a week old yet, but we were more experienced and determined than ever. And as the last of the autumn sun bathed our canvas, we dared to believe that we might actually achieve our deadline. It's early December, the weather is miserable, it's uh, very cold, very wet, and we have no heating and much exposure to the elements with all of these open doorways which are still quite a few days away from being closed up. So we're trying to keep warm. We have a few heaters around like this trusty bathroom radiator which is sort of trying to warm up our future bedroom to the best of its ability. Not really working though. Uh, but really fighting the elements is uh, the biggest struggle right now. Um, because we, we don't have the time to allow the weather to pass. Uh, we need to stay focused and push through because in less than a week, we are moving in. And here lies only the beginning part of one of the greatest and most uncomfortable delays that beset our project, the installation of our air conditioning units. We'd selected models that would be efficient at both heating and cooling the many rooms of the apartment, and best of all is that they were to be entirely paid for by the Italian state, thanks to a scheme promoting energy efficiency. And with that same statement, perhaps you can also understand the delay. The predispositions had actually been ready by week two, but all this time later we still hadn't navigated the famously complex Italian bureaucracy to unlock the purchase of these air conditioning machines. What had initially seemed to be an amazing state incentive was turning into a poison chalice, as it dawned on us that we'd have to face a winter with no proper heating system installed at all. Unfortunately, the bad news didn't end there. Just when we were expecting to receive and install the kitchen which I'd designed and purchased months before, we were told that the global supply issues caused by the most recent COVID surge meant that we wouldn't be able to receive it until a week after we were due to move in. Whilst we were fine with the idea of living on takeout for an extra week, it did mean that the final few days before we had to relocate were a little muted as we were stopped from making that final push that we'd hoped for. All that there was left to do was to put up temporary doorways to make our wing of the apartment airtight, and with a little spare time to play with, we took a therapeutic shopping trip to the world-famous antique fair at Arezzo. Video coming on that very soon. Back on site on our final day before moving, we finished tiling the spaces connecting our three target rooms, and added Carrara marble thresholds, sourced locally at a quarry, at the entrance of each of these spaces. That night, with the help of a friend of ours, we slowly started to move everything we had to our name into the fresco room. Despite selling our old apartment fully furnished, we still had a shocking amount of stuff, from building tools to new items we'd started collecting for the different spaces, to supplies to get us through the first few weeks of rough living. And just like that, our time had run out. Each of the three target spaces had transformed enormously, and we reflected with a quiet pride on our progress. But this was only the beginning. There still remained six principal rooms and three bathrooms in the apartment that we had yet to even lay hands on. And even in our target spaces, the kitchen, proper heating, and the many finishing touches still eluded us.
And with that little sneak peek, I cordially and humbly invite you to join us on this journey by subscribing and pressing the bell icon so that you can find us again. Thank you so much for being a part of this story. And until the next episode of Renovating a Palace, goodbye from us and the charming city of Florence.